I'm getting used to seeing some faces around here that are becoming familiar to me. It's good to see you, and you honor our Lord with your presence tonight. And I trust that the time that we have spent together this week, this weekend, has been profitable for you. It has been for me because every time I present these lessons, my faith is shored up. And again, I want to uh, mention my appreciation to the song leaders. There have been four different, five different, how many? Four different song leaders. Uh, and they've all done an excellent job. And you know, it's, it's amazing how many songs are related and inspired by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Wow. The reason I had Brother David read 2 Peter 1, verses 12 through 15 there, was because I've been using the same introduction to the, to the lessons today uh, about the resurrection and the importance of it. And Peter said, I'm going to remind you by reminding you by giving you a reminder. We learn best through repetition. The Apostle Peter realized that, of course, he's, he's speaking from the words of God. But he realizes the importance of reminders. And that's what I meant about how I, it shores up my faith to hear lessons and to present lessons about the resurrection. The most perhaps, well, undoubtedly, the most important part of our faith. The resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is undeniably the most important event in the history of mankind. If it happened, it verifies the existence of God and the Bible as His Word. Now you stop and think about that. With the evidences that we've presented so far today, the first two lessons and now the final lesson, think about how powerful that message is that Jesus lived and died. I have seen articles and writings and different things about people challenging the fact that, you know, I've seen, seen young people ask, well, there's even no proof that Jesus historically lived. That's the biggest lie that there is. There's, there's more historical evidence that Jesus lived than Alexander the Great. He is one of the most written about historical figures that's ever been in history. And the account of his resurrection from the dead shows us, number one, that there is a God and that the Bible is the Word of God because it is what tells us, foretells of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and gives us the account itself. If it happened, it verifies Jesus as the Christ the Messiah, the Deliverer, and the Savior of the world. And if it happened, it verifies our own resurrection from the dead. As we sang that song, He rolled away the stone, and our stone also will be rolled away metaphorically, that we can be raised from the dead Death has no dominion over us in Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 15, the Apostle Paul wrote, Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God 
that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. So the inspired apostle brings to their mind that to deny our own resurrection from the dead is to deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet, as we noted already today, all the witnesses that bore witness and testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So while there have been many skeptics, and of course, the majority of the world even yet today would deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ, even among those who some call themselves Christian will deny it, as we noted this morning. The evidence has to be examined. In the first lesson this morning in our Bible class hour, we discussed how Jesus predicted his resurrection. The witnesses who saw it and proclaimed it, and some skeptics we noted in history who were converted by it. And still yet today, we find those who at one time did not believe and went to examine and even disprove the historic Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus Christ go away perplexed and often converted if they will but honestly look at the evidence and come to the conclusion of its authenticity. The last lesson that we had at the morning worship hour, we discussed some theories of modernists who deny the resurrection and we offered alternative explanations. So many times when people offer a theory, they are blind to the alternatives to their theory. Now, I, I've got to be careful here because I, I can get off track when I start talking about theories. I want to mention this for the benefit of our young people. I don't care what your teachers in school or professors at the university or colleges say. Evolution is still a theory cannot be proven scientifically. They build a case based upon some scientific evidences, but not all the scientific evidences. And the evidence of creation far outweighs the scientific evidence of evolution. Like I said, that's a sidebar. I'm getting off track. But when we talk about theories, I can't help but mention that. It is a theory. And the theories that we talked about this morning, and we'll talk about a couple of more this evening, about the resurrection, how to explain away the resurrection, are theories. And Whenever there's a theory, there's always an alternative explanation. Tonight we're going to continue with some modernist theories and then discuss the importance of the resurrection to us, Christians, believers. Did the disciples invent myths? Did they, in their own imagination? decide that this Jesus whom they followed and believed in, when he was crucified and their faith in him crumbled, were they such intelligent, educated men that they got together and they said, well, we can still make a Christ, a Messiah out of him. Let's just tell people he raised from the dead. Let's steal away his body, which was, as we noted this morning, that which was told by the Jews at that time. 
Let's steal away his body and hide it and say that he raised from the dead. These were common, ordinary people, just like you and me. There were no scholars among them. Fishermen, laborers, a tax collector, a zealot. And they, with their combined wisdom, came up with a resurrection story. Did they invent myths? Myths are stories or legends that take a generation or two to build up. You have to wait. In order to, to perpetuate a myth, you have to wait until those who know the truth about something aren't around to dismiss it as a myth. We have today what we commonly call urban legends. And that is stories that get passed around. And, and today, it's easier to pass around a myth than ever before in history because of the internet, Facebook, Twitter, all the others, in which people are able to get on there and just make an assertion and, you know, they might throw in, well, now this Dr. So-and-so said, and, and, and there's the evidence, and here's the proof, and there's not a, really a shred of evidence. Now, how many of you have heard, well, now, I knew a fellow who knew a fellow that told this woman that, and that's how myths go. There's no specifics. There's no specific names mentioned. There's, there's no way to check it out to make sure it's true. That's a myth. You see. Myths, as I said, need a generation or two so that those who know the facts aren't there to dismiss it. The Gospels have characteristics of eyewitnesses, not myths that could easily be discredited at the time that they were told. As we noted, there were 500 witnesses, as Paul states in 1 Corinthians 15, more than 500 witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And at the time, among the first testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was among those who were least likely to be believed and accepted in society as general and, and even among the disciples. Because those women who are recorded as being the first to see that Jesus was no longer in the tomb, and they went back to the male disciples and told them, he's not there. And we've seen an angel that told us that he has risen from the dead. And they said, oh, come on, you're kidding me. They didn't believe him. Women were not acceptable witnesses at that time. You've come a long ways, ladies. And the amazing thing about this is that it shows that God truly is no respecter of persons. When people talk about the Apostle Paul and Peter and others who wrote about the different responsibilities that God has given to men and to women, and they say, well, they're, they're a bunch of chauvinists. Jesus was the most liberating person that had ever lived for women. And he gave to them the first witness and testimony of his resurrection. And then a member of the Sanhedrin, a council member. Remember it was that body of Jewish, I guess we could call them legislators, 
who convicted Jesus, cried out for his, his, his death, his crucifixion. The Sanhedrin was responsible for finding him guilty of the lies that were perpetuated at his trial. And yet a member of that, Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the council, came and asked for the body of Jesus and took it and put it into his own tomb to be interred. And then the Apostle Paul, as he stated, these 500 witnesses, most of whom were still alive, 27 years after the fact, it's believed that the letter to the Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians was written about 57 A.D., the death of Jesus occurred 30 A.D. Some people use 33, depending on the calendar that you want to use. But within 27 years of his death, still people alive easily could have been questioned and disproved. And yet, they're there still testifying and bearing witness. The Apostle Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He denied that they were myths. He denied that they were fables. Cunningly devised fables. And certainly it would have been cunning for them to come up with this within three days of his death. If the resurrection did not happen, then it was not a myth. It was a deliberate lie. Perpetuated by men who wrote... the most holy and righteous way of life that we are challenged to live every day of our life. Can you imagine the men that wrote, do not lie, but tell the truth. Love your neighbor as yourself. And quoting from Jesus, and then writing the epistles that they wrote about abstaining from worldly desires and lusts and presenting your bodies as bondservants of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine those men coming up with this great lie? While teaching righteousness and godliness and self-control. Were the disciples deceived? That's another explanation. Well, they, they had this communal hallucination. <laughs> they, they, they were all together, and I, I, don't, I don't quite understand this, this explanation, this theory about how they come up, but, but, but somehow... They came up with the idea that it's, it's kind of like, pardon, pardon this example, but it's kind of like a bunch of hippies sitting around smoking dope and all seeing the same hallucination. <laughs> or maybe, uh, and, and, I, and I, don't, I don't, you know, there have been people who use hallucinogens to be able to prophesy, to be able to foretell things. And they used hallucinogens to do it. Can you imagine accusing all the disciples of being of a common hallucination? It's called the hallucination theory. <clears throat> the disciples in their state of shock and certainly they were shocked. We mentioned that, that they, when Jesus was crucified, they didn't know what, they scattered. 
They hid in inner rooms and, and they were shaking and trembling. What do we do now if they've crucified Jesus? What do they do to us? And all their, all their aspirations about how Jesus was the Messiah and he was going to be the king and he was going to establish the righteousness of the kingdom of David upon the earth and, and make the Jewish nation great again. And it's all gone. In one day, it's all gone. And in that state of shock, they hallucinate the appearance of Jesus Christ. Hallucinations don't happen to groups of people like that. They don't see the same visions, even if you've got a, a room full of people taking the same hallucinogen. They don't see the same hallucination. And, it, and, and, and it being on different occasions at different times, with different people to have the same hallucination? It's absurd. It's ridiculous. It's impossible. But the disciples themselves had to be persuaded that they weren't just seeing things. As we read some verses already, but Mark 16, verses 9 through 13. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. And she went and told those who had been with him, and they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and, and went into the country. And they went away and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. See, they had to be convinced they couldn't believe the eyewitness testimony of, as we mentioned a moment ago, the women that saw it. And then there's the wrong tomb theory. You see, it was dark in the morning when the women went. And they got the wrong tomb. And the angel that came and spoke to them, or the man that came and spoke to them, told them, you've got the wrong tomb. Observe the tomb. Here is the one he was in. Well, it overlooks the statement, he's not here because he's risen. Let me get the slide to go. Help. <laughs> Thank you. Oops. Oh, oops. Can we get that up to Scripture? Thank you. Mark 16, 6. But he said to them, this is the angel, as, re as recorded in the Gospels, and of course the skeptics would say it was just a man that was there. Do not be alarmed, you seek Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified. And then they look over this part, he is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? He's not at this tomb, he's over at this tomb. No. That's not what was said. He is risen. He's not in this tomb because he's risen. It's funny. Maybe not funny, maybe sad. The way people sometimes overlook things in Scripture. We deal with it all the time, don't we? They want to make Scripture say something that it doesn't say. And people get so desperate to make it say something else that they can take a statement like he has risen and just take it out and this was not a modern day cemetery the tomb stood alone it's a private burial place as we mentioned a moment ago when Joseph had taken the body he wrapped it in a clean, a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed, Matthew 27, verses 59 and 60. What does the resurrection mean to the Christian? What does the resurrection mean to you and to me? What should it mean to us? 
It's necessary, number one, to be a Christian. We noted this morning in the Bible class of people who call themselves Christians and yet they deny the miracles of the Bible and even the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, what does it say? that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. To be a Christian, to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, you have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's, it is the necessary part of the saving sacrifice that Jesus offered on the cross. So many times people want to talk about how we're saved by the grace of God, which is the blood that was shed upon the cross, and still deny the resurrection from the dead. You can't. And it's because of the resurrection that we are baptized. We often talk about the command to be baptized. But do we recognize the significance of what baptism symbolizes? When we are buried in water. Let's look at the scripture, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now let me just back up just a moment. I'm going to stop just a second. When the translators translated the Bible from, it was written in Koine Greek. The Koine simply means the common language. The common language of the time. It's a different Greek language than what is spoken today. It's a dead language, which means that it never changes, which makes it so perfect for translating. Because the meaning of the words never change from what they were. And so when the translators started translating it from the Koine Greek into different languages, and, and in this case, of course, the English language, they transliterated a term. Now, transliterate means they take a foreign word and make it a current word. For instance, corral. We're, we're in Oklahoma. If you don't know what a corral is, uh, you must be lost. <laughs> but that's a Spanish word. It means an enclosure, a fence. <laughs> and we know what a corral, but that's a Spanish word. Lasso, another Spanish word. Many of the cowboy terms that we use came from the Spanish cowboys, the Mexican cowboys. So they took the word baptisma, Greek word, baptisma, and they made it an English word, baptism. They took the Greek word baptizo, and they made it an English word, baptize, from the noun and the verb. They didn't translate it. And the reason why they didn't translate it was because if they had, it would create a problem. And the problem was that at the time that the Bible began to be translated, the common form of baptism was sprinkling or pouring. And if they translated that word, it would raise some questions because the word means to be immersed or submerged. You see the problem? So they transliterated it. And you can look it up in Webster's Dictionary and it will say, under baptize or baptism, it will say to sprinkle, pour, or immerse. Because that's what they wanted it to mean. But if you study the Koine Greek language, you'll find that that 
It doesn't mean that. The English definition may mean that, but not the Koine Greek. So let's read this verse again, shall we? Or do you not know that as many of us as were immersed or buried into Christ Jesus were immersed into his death? Therefore we were buried. And that, that, that ought to give somebody a, a clue right there. They use a word to describe what baptism is. We were buried with him through immersion into his death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in newness of life. So here's the picture that the inspired writer is giving. We are buried, we are immersed in water, and we are raised to a new life because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are not raised to a new life. The power of the resurrection gives us the new life. It's because of the resurrection that we have a living hope. Not a dead hope. Not a temporarily paused hope. But a hope that is alive all the time. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. The Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We do not serve a dead martyr. We serve a living Savior. And he's not just living alive in our heart, as the song says. He is alive and he is reigning at the right hand of God to this very moment. And it is because of the resurrection that we worship. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26, as Paul gave them instruction concerning the memorial feast that Jesus gave on the night that he was betrayed, when he took bread and he said, eat this in memory of my body. And he took the cup and he said, drink this in memory of the blood that is shed. Before it ever happened, he knew it was going to happen and he gave them this wonderful living memorial feast for us to partake of. And they did so upon the first day of the week and there's one every week, 52 times a year. And he said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We spent two lessons talking about the second coming of Christ, and we noted in those lessons that the reason why we look forward to a second coming is because he raised from the dead. He's alive today. He's coming back. And we eat this memorial feast looking forward to that. Looking forward to the time that he will come back and raise us to our immortal bodies. And it is because of the resurrection that we live moral lives. We strive daily. To be the kind of person that Jesus wants us to be, that God wants us to be. And that is our goal. The song, buried with Christ, risen anew. The scripture, buried with Christ, raised to a new life. We're not the same person anymore. We crucify, we put to death, as Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith, faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. We put to death our old man. And we put anew a life in Christ. Acts 17, verse 30 and 31, the apostle Paul, as he spoke to the heathen Athenians, 
those who had a, a, an image, an idol to every kind of God they could think of, and even to the one to the unknown God. And that Paul said, that's the one I want to tell you about. I want to tell you about the one true and living God. And he said that the times of ignorance, the time of not knowing him, God has overlooked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent because we are to repent, to turn away from being the old man and, and to turn to being what the Lord wants us to be. We turn away. That, the word repent means actually to, to go the opposite direction. You're going one way, the way you want to live, and now you repent, you turn around, and you go the opposite way, the way He wants you to live. I no longer live for myself, I live for Jesus Christ. Because He has appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained, and He's given assurance of this to all by raising Him from the dead. It is because we know Jesus raised from the dead, that we live the life that we live and look forward to the day when we will be united forever with our God in heaven. The evidence of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is overwhelming to me. I hope it is to you. Again, we mentioned that if you've missed the first two lessons, they are available, they've been recorded, they'll be available online. Acts 1, verses 1 through 3. Remember Sir Charles Ramsey, we mentioned him this morning in the Bible class. He was, a, he was an agnostic or an atheist that became a believer, and he wrote the book about Luke, and Luke as a first-rate historian, he said. Here is Luke and what Luke had to write that Sir Charles Ramsey so much praised. The former account I made, he wrote, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Yes, the disciples had it all wrong about what the kingdom was about, but after Jesus raised from the dead, he set them straight. And he gave them the Holy Spirit that they might be guided into all the truth. And then they began to teach, and thus we know what the kingdom of God is really all about. It's the kingdom of God assembled here this evening. The saints of Jesus Christ. We are His kingdom. He is our King. And He reigns to this very day. And we are His subjects. And we serve our King daily. Many skeptics have been won over to faith by the evidence that we've talked about. Faith in the resurrection is indispensable, though, to the Christian. Not everybody will be convinced. Jesus, when he told the account of the rich man and Lazarus, there's some discussion about whether it's a parable or not. It doesn't matter. I don't think. We can debate it, talk about it. But the point is that Jesus told something that's real about two men who died. One who went to torment in Hades and the other who went to comfort in Abraham's bosom. And I notice here that as Jesus related the rich man in torment, Abraham is the one that's being quoted in this verse, Luke 16, 31. As the rich man had said, send back Lazarus, I've got brothers back on earth. Send them back and warn them not to come to this place of torment. Warn them to change their life. Not be the kind of person that I, am, I was or that they probably still are. And this is what the response was. 
If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. We do live by faith and not by sight. Paul wrote as much to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. But the evidence, like the creation account, like all the evidence that the Bible had to come from one mind, and that mind knowing more than any human being could ever tell, the mind of God. The evidence that gives us our faith, our belief, compiled into our faith, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What will you do with this evidence, I ask? Have you submitted to Jesus Christ as Lord of your life? Do you believe that he is the only begotten Son of God? That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said that unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, he said. We've got to believe in Jesus Christ. We are justified by faith. But even as James wrote, even the demons believe and tremble. Faith is not just, yes, I believe, Faith is, yes, I'm committed. Committed to Jesus Christ as Lord of my life because as we noted a moment ago in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. We've got to be willing to change. We've got to be, quit living the way we want to live and start living the way He teaches us. And be willing to confess that faith as the eunuch did and to be buried with him, immersed in water. Let me quote some scriptures here. Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, Jesus told his disciples, Go preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. Now let me tell you what you commonly hear many preachers televangelists say today he that believes is saved and then is baptized that's one of those cases where they take the words and just listen to what he said he that believes and is baptized shall be saved he that believes not shall be condemned well why would someone why didn't he say he that believes not and is not baptized well why would someone that doesn't believe be baptized But listen to the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. As he quoted from Scripture from David, Be this known unto you that this Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ, he said in Acts chapter 2. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Men and brethren, what shall we do? We have crucified the Savior. They are convicted based upon the scriptures that were written in the Psalms that Jesus would raise from the dead. That's what it took for them. Imagine that. All they needed to do was hear the scriptures. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said unto them, Acts 2 and verse 38, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And with many other words, that's not the end of the sermon, you see. Paul preached till midnight. I may do that tonight. We've got another six hours. And with many other words, he did testify and exhort them, saying... Be saved from this crooked generation. If we don't live in a crooked generation, nobody ever did. And those who gladly received his word, verse 41, 
were baptized. And there were added unto them, those disciples, in that day, about 3,000 souls. 3,000 people. I don't know how many were standing there at that porch around the temple when they preached, but 3,000 of them got it right away. They didn't say, what, be baptized. Why do we need to be dunked in water? To be saved? Why? No, no, no. They just, that, that's what they were told to do, and they did it. Why would people question it today? It doesn't take away the action of faith. It, in, it enforces it. If you really believe, you'll be and do what the Lord wants you to be and do. And to live a life. Folks, you're not looking at a perfect man. And I'm not looking at perfect people. We strive every day to be godly and righteous. And all too often we fail. And people look at us and say, well, you know, you're supposed to be perfect. You're a Christian. No, we're not perfect we are forgiven. Forgiven. If we walk in the light, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, I'm taking advantage of the last sermon I've got with you. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, all unrighteousness. You see, if walking in the light meant perfect Obedience being perfect, never sinning. We don't need the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We always need the blood of Jesus Christ. He went on to say in verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, here is the Christian, if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He's writing to Christians, you see. This is our way of benefiting from the blood of Jesus Christ. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some of our unrighteousness. That's not what it says. Let me quote it again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from most of our unrighteousness. I still didn't get it right, did I? Third time's a charm. Listen. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Christian, live your life with confidence in your forgiveness. We're not perfect. And we sometimes we get down on ourselves because we're not. But he is there to forgive us. His blood is there to cleanse us from our sins. Live with confidence in the salvation our Lord gives us. While we strive every day to be what we ought to be. The invitation is yours. It's his invitation, not mine. Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You can do it. I don't care who you are. Jesus said, you can can do it right now as we stand and sing.